chapter 14. At 3.15 in the afternoon, Josie Dempsey was making her famous seafood gumbo. Her age-old family recipe had been published in Talk About Good, a popular cookbook out of Lafayette, Louisiana. The smell alone would bring the neighbors a knocking. She had wanted to do something special for William's birthday, and gumbo, along with fresh banana pudding, seemed like just the thing. She had on the apron that her husband, Hugh, had bestowed upon her before he died. A large crawfish decorated the apron, along with the words, pinch me, peel me, suck me, eat me. He had picked it up at the Bow Bridge Crawfish Festival, and she remembered him walking and wearing the thing after an adventurous weekend with her brothers. Josie saw a lot of Hugh and William, tall and handsome, chestnut hair, kind, with good bedside manners, every mother's dream. While his friends were off in Florida partying for spring break, William had gone to Central America to help the poor. He most definitely inherited his father's tender side. William's maternal genes were a different story. He had the fiery Puerto Rican temper of his grandmother. The Southern Belle began pulling gulf shrimp out of a clear bag and peeling them like a pro. Winston cigarette dangled from her lips, the cherry hanging precariously over the counter. The overpowering stench of Zatarain's crab boil filled the house, causing her eyes to water. She had opened the back door for this very reason. Outside, birds chirped in the humid September air. No doubt, in a while, the next door neighbor, Mr. DeFazio, a retired military man, would smell the gumbo and come over and say, Smells like you got something good cooking. On the floor in a five gallon bucket stirred a dozen blue point crabs. Josie bent over and with a pair of tongs grabbed one of the feisty crustaceans. The rest of the clan jostled for position, perhaps a chance to slip to the bottom of the bucket to gain a brief reprieve. She dropped the crabs one by one into the boiling water and watched as they turned a bright red orange, like a burnt red sun bleeding over the horizon. The crabs momentarily fought like champion gladiators, but soon died off like robots running out of juice. After setting the rice on autopilot, Josie went on to the back porch for another smoke. She saw a squirrel traversing the power line like a ballerina, its tail flapping merrily. She heard kids arguing in the neighborhood one block over. No, you're it. No, you are. I know you are, but what am I? And then a mother joined in the fray. Y'all cut that out. The phone rang from inside the house, and it was all she could do to answer it on the fifth ring. It was Hannah, the Dutch girl, and she wasted no time with pleasantries. Yes, they have killed Jimmy's partner, Rucka Finesse. Killed? Josie's arms stiffened. Oh my God, you gotta be joking. What happened? Hannah relayed the details of the murder. I do not have a good feeling, Yossi. I believe these same men are in search for Jimmy. Oh, dear God, Jamesy stammered. My father said he is working on plan. Okay, well, what am I supposed to do in the meantime? You must be patient, Yossi. Down at the docks, Danny said to William, Still getting bleeders, huh? William knew that Danny liked to pick on greenhorns. Oh, fuck you, you box throw machine. I'm not doing this shit forever. Next year, my ass is going to be in Starkville off the college. Danny flexed his muscles. Jokingly, he said, Man, you got to be kidding me. This shit's much funner than college. You'll see next year. Yeah, I'm going to miss this place, William said sarcastically. Well, your mom thought doing this for a year would be good for you. 
She thought it would make you work hard, so you don't end up with these. Danny showed William his hands, which looked like two worn catcher's mitts. Before I quit smoking, I used to impress all the women by putting cigarettes out on them. Are my hands going to look like that after a year on the job? William asked. Nah, it's taken me ten years to get them this way. Damn, said William. I was really looking forward to showing off for the sorority sisters next year. William's muscles felt like cooked pasta, even after a full summer on the port. It takes a while before you get used to it, Danny said back. Now that they were heading into the winter, William hoped for cooler days. His back and hands and feet hurt like hell. They'd finished 17 trucks that day. While finishing number 18, Joe Meese finally said that it was quitting time. William thought about his mother's cooking. She had told him earlier in the morning that she had planned on making something special for his birthday. He placed his bet on gumbo and he would not be disappointed. When the day ended, there was that look of thank God it's over written on the longshoremen's faces as they made their way to an assembly of pickups, sedans, and Bonnevilles, each displaying some combination of dents, gashes, and or scratches. Whistles and squawks could be heard from the moving packs, tobacco juice seemed flying this way and that. William knew that most of these men would stay around their houses for the rest of the weekend, drinking beer and barbecuing, enjoying their families, thinking about how they would pay, thinking about how they would pay next month's bills in the next. Some of the boys would fight with their wives or ex-wives. Others would get so loaded that they'd get arrested. These were hard men with hard lives who always had something on their backs who rarely got a break. And when they did happen upon good fortune, most failed to take advantage of it. Other longshoremen were church-going folk, giving a portion of their wages to the heavens, looking for divine intervention to bail them out. William had a difficult time imagining the rest of his life in this environment. No, a different world awaited him, he hoped. This can't be what it's all about. Not that these aren't good men. They are. They really are. They do an honest day's job. The fact is they have no extra time in their lives and they're making their money now. They know that one day their bodies will shut down and they'll be sitting around the house living off their savings. The lucky ones will invest a little, take care of life's debts and breeze into retirement with a full set of teeth. Before they left, William said to Danny, You sure you don't want to come over for dinner? I'll bet Mama made some of her good banana pudding. I'm done with the nanners for today, brother man. Danny had that serious look that said, Don't press it further. We'll go out next week and celebrate your birthday. Pick up some chicks or something. The longshoreman winked. Well, uh, call me if you change your mind. Danny shot him the peace sign and lumbered toward his blue Chevy S10. By Saturday night, Constantine's frustration had gotten the best of him. He couldn't remember the last time he'd been so angry. For Yari Fisser to have disobeyed a direct order, even after he'd reiterated the point that they needed Rucker to find Hunt, meant a lack of respect. Before passing the information on to Yari that Rucker was screwing his whore, Constantine had feared that the unruly gangster wouldn't be able to control himself. And now Rucker was dead. Still, Yari had promised patience. Damn fool, the Sicilian yelled inwardly. Now with Rucker dead, that means the family's down feeks. Doesn't look good. What are we going to do? Hell, Nothing looks good at this moment. How are we going to find the fucking money now? Rucker was our only lead. Now what? Jean St. Pierre, French assassin, stood before the Sicilian. Constantine said, So, you think you can track down this hunt, do you? The Frenchman didn't smile, didn't say a word. He didn't even flinch. His demeanor said it all. 
follow the girl for now, Constantine instructed. But whatever you do, don't harm her. Is that understood? He gave the assassin a hand of Funnenberg's address. John St. Pierre, a most wanted man in Interpol's black book, replied. What shall I do then? Follow her, I said, but no violence. St. Pierre hated such restraints, especially from a greedy man like Constantine Vanderpoel. It'll cost you, he said to the Zalem boss. Constantine offered a cold stare. He said, how does 20,000 guilders sound? Before he walked out the door, the assassin took only a second to say, I'll have the information for you soon. At first, Hannah crossed it off to Deja Vu, but as the day wore on, she noticed something peculiar. She didn't know what to think. Had she seen someone? Or was it something she was forgetting to do? Maybe someone was following her. But no, wait, that's not it either. Whatever it was, for the life of her, she couldn't figure it out. It was all too confusing, really. When she left her flat, Hannah said to herself, there it is again. No, wait, it's a man. He's in the crowd, watching me. I see him there. Yes, subliminally, she'd known it all along. Her intuition suddenly told her to watch out for this one. He's dangerous. Hannah turned to face the man and felt a contemptuous aura surrounding the stranger, like the devil's aura. She then met his eyes and saw the cold stare of an evil face looking back at her. Stay cool, she told herself. Don't fall apart. He's just watching you. She wondered why this man had been following her. She looked back and got a better glimpse this time. Dark skin with a stubbly beard. No, don't kid yourself. He's after Jimmy. It has something to do with Jimmy. Slow down, let him get closer. Get a good look at his face. Your father definitely will want a description. Jean St. Pierre slowed his pace. He didn't want the girl to get a good account of him. From what he could tell, she was as beautiful as a redhead could be. Quickly, he found himself making a mental check about other redheads. They were all the garden variety, curly haired type, pale skin with freckles. This one was different, and he sensed feistiness in her. No, he said silently, reprimanding himself. You must behave yourself. Just follow the girl, no violence. Fucking bastard Sicilian and his rules. Hannah felt the distance between them closing. She turned around and was drawn into the most sinister eyes she had ever seen. Claret red eyes with silver specks. But wait, if this man's following me, then it must mean Jimmy's alive. She suddenly had hope. It had Constantine Vanderpoel's name written all over it. Lay low, her father had told her. These men are not people to m m mess around with. And what does she do? She marches straight into the lion's den, right out into the public. Her father would be pissed that she was meeting with Bubs especially now. But when Bubs had called and said she was coming to Ternosian, Hannah couldn't resist. Well, let's meet at the stair, she had told her best friend. It's been so long, and I need to talk to someone, let off a little steam. There he was again, and now she noticed dark, greasy hair protruding from a black beanie, a criminal, anyone would say. Not an uncommon sight in Ternosian Centrum, now that she knew she was being followed, she used her peripherals to hone in on her predator. She thought that she saw the remnants of a scar curling off the side of the man's lip. Pretend you don't notice him. Keep going. It was still early and Bubs wouldn't be over for another half hour. She went inside the Bundy's to kill some time. Perhaps she'd be able to get a word in with Augustino. The Mozambican was busy, so she ordered a coffee and took a lone table in the back. On the way, she caught her reflection in the mirror on the wall. A tired, worn-out girl on the edge of a nervous breakdown stared back at her. She felt angrier by the minute. 
She was mad at Hunt, mad at Rucker, mad at her father, and most of all, mad at herself. Normally, she was as cool as a cucumber. She dealt with scum buckets her whole life. No, this one was dangerous. Her subconscious had been, be careful. She noticed the man now sitting at the bar on the other side of the pub. Creep, she said to herself. Maybe she should move around. It might be letting him get too close. Outside, the cheerful carnival noises of Ternosian filled the air. Street dealers, tourists, locals, drunks, teenagers, Moroccans, Turks, and Africans all hung out in front of the Bundys, the stair, the doors, and then lope and dies. A coagulation of races and criminals and drug tourists skirting a half kilometer of pubs, rock joints, and ash bars. And them disappeared into the crowd, hoping that her predator would lose her scent. The mirage of people swallowed the young redhead. Around her, doors to pubs and cafes opening and closing as if on revolving hinges. People entering left and right simultaneously, congruously, some stutter stepping. Blues music flooding out from the stair, heavy metal from the Bundys, soft rock from the doors, and disco from the loping dies. Drug transactions taking place in broad daylight. Where the hell were the police? When she arrived at the stair, Hannah found Bubs already sitting there, sipping on a cappuccino. It's been dreadful in Flushing, and Bubs had told her after they'd hugged, kissed, and said hello. Well, there's plenty of excitement going on here, Hannah put in, wondering if she should tell her friend of the predicament that she was in at the moment. Yeah, people are dropping like flies, and now this creep's following me and might show up any second. Bubs leaned in a little closer to Hannah. So tell me, what's all this fuss about your American boyfriend? Hannah updated her friend. It's just awful. I haven't been able to talk to anybody either. Don't you worry. Bubsy will take good care of you. You tell me everything. 